Hi there, Mark here, back again with another video. Uh, this time another lockdown special in detail video. And in this uh, particular video, we're going to be talking about the uh, Jaguar XK8's engine and drivetrain in a bit more detail. So here we are, back in the uh, back in the Jag after getting it back from my parents during this lockdown uh, phase, uh, whilst I sort of swapped it for the the Lotus. Um, I think I probably should have made clear in my in my Lotus uh, video that I hadn't swapped the Jaguar for the Lotus and getting rid of this car. Uh, I'm merely swapping it in terms of drive space uh, on my parents' drive and parking this outside of uh, our house. Um, so. The Jaguar engine and drivetrain then, I'll start at the front and uh, start with the engine and then uh, the gearbox and then finally kind of the exhaust system and things and talk a little bit about that. I'm not going to go into crazy detail about um, like the engine's construction and valve sizes and all that kind of gubbins. I'm just going to focus mainly on um, uh, what it is, what it does, uh, the power it produces and um, the common things to look for uh, that might go wrong with it um, if you're in the market for an XK8 and you might be uh, worried about um, you know, reliability or whatever, so a few things to, to watch for. So the XK8 engine then, uh, what is it? Well, it's a 4 litre um, V8, all alloy, 32 valve quad cam engine, developing about 290 horsepower for the first XK8s that came out. It featured a rapid warm-up system, Nicosil bore liners uh, and two-stage variable valve timing. And actually it was only the uh, fourth different type of engine that Jaguar had ever produced. Um, so at the beginning of production, that's kind of uh, what this uh, engine was about and it was called the AJ26. Um, a bit later, so sort of 97 or so, um, or 98 rather, um, the XKR came out. So the XK8's kind of more sporty sister, I guess. And uh, the engine dropped the uh, variable valve timing, um, but it did introduce a supercharger. So power rocketed up to about 370 horsepower there. And this again was still called the AJ26, although with the um, introduction of a supercharger. And the engines uh, for both the XK8 and the XKR pretty much remained um, similar throughout the lifespan of the, XK of the X100 series. Um, but the changes that would come into the engines would sort of be introduced to the naturally aspirated one first and then onto the supercharged one there's kind of a pattern there so for example around um 99 there were changes to uh, the fuel system and, and that kind of stuff as well as a move to um different type of cruise control etc and that happened on the xk8 before the xkr um but only sort of like six months to a year apart i'm not sure why maybe it's a simpler uh, introduction to put it on naturally aspirated engine whereas maybe the supercharged one needed more testing who knows it's just a guess um so i mentioned there um the nicosil bore liners now what they're there for are to uh, reduce weight effectively and what it is is a very slippery material that's coated on the inside of the bores of the cylinders and um it means that the engine wear is very very limited so it um lasts a long time it's superior to a steel um, bore liner but uh, one of the things to, to be aware of if you're thinking of purchasing an earlier XK8 is that due to the uh, I think it might be the certain sulfur content in the fuel or something like that around the late 90s it would actually um, wear away this Nicosil bore liner and uh, there's all sorts of compression issues with the earlier engines if they'd been affected by this. Uh, Jaguar replaced a lot of the engines under warranty and if you've got a replacement engine you'll know that um, it's been replaced because it's got a green sticker on the on the back of the of the engine cover um, but that's kind of ancient history now to some regard so if you're looking at an earlier one and you're worried about this problem then you can get a compression test done but because it was such a long time ago if the car's been regularly used then any issues with this kind of thing is going to you know come uh, bubble to the surface at some point and it's probably been sorted out so um, less of an issue to worry about now than um, sort of 10, 15 years ago, but still be aware of it and uh, you know just do your homework. And um, if you're in any doubt, you can always get a, um, someone who's qualified to do a compression test or something to, to check it out for you. So another issue that um, the XK8 suffered from um, over its beginning of its uh, life <clears throat> up until sort of 2002, 2003 was the use of um, plastic uh, chain 
timing chain tensioners. So uh, what would happen is that these would become brittle over time and actually break. So the upper um, chain tensioners uh, being the most sort of catastrophic of those. So if they if they break and cause the timing chain to um, slip and stuff, then you're going to be in for a very expensive bill as the engine sort of mashes into the um, the pistons, mash into the valves and things like that. If you're looking at a car sort of pre, so any sort of four litre car, I guess, I mean, there was a, a revised chain tensioner that came in around 2000, 2001, something like that, but it wasn't a complete fix to the issue. So if, on an earlier car, always, uh, if you're going to buy one, then sort of demand proof that they've been cha changed for the later 4.2 uh, all metal chain tensioner type because um, they're the only real solution to this problem and if someone can't produce the uh, necessary sort of paperwork to say that it's been done then you know it's sort of a haggling point I guess as it costs sort of a thousand pounds ish to get uh, the top and bottom chain tensioners done so the uh, finally uh, the other thing to watch out for on the four liter engines are the um, water pumps so they had initially uh, sort of plastic impellers inside them and due to sort of time and age and things these would break up and would find their way into the engine's waterways and uh, cause blockages and that kind of thing and that would be quite terminal for an engine if it overheats in certain places etc etc so uh, the way to sort of tell I mean I don't know exactly but I've been told that the water pump housing is also um, metal so have a look at have a look for that um, it's best just to do your homework again. I mean, I, I, I go by um, this book, which I've mentioned before, which is kind of like a magazine book that Jaguar World did uh, a long time ago, but it's got all, sort of all sorts of buying information in there and what to look for and muzzle differences and stuff like that. It's, it's worth getting something like that or a dedicated um, buying guide off the internet or something. Um, so that's kind of the, the four litre uh, cupboard. Um, Great engine, um, plenty of power there. And one of the things which uh, is great about the XK8 engine for all years really, is the amount of torque that's available from um, quite low down in the rev range. So once you sort of get up to like 1500 RPM or something like that, the torque is available right up until the red line. So you don't need to rev the engine like crazy to actually get a move on. It, it kind of gets up and goes um, from, from um, sort of civilized uh, engine revs. Uh, <clears throat> so I think it's something like 80% of the torque is available 90% of the time. I'm making it up, but it's something like that. I'll put up the stat on the screen now, the, the actual uh, stat for that. So in 2003, um, we got a, a slightly different engine, and this was the 4.2 version of the, um, of the XK8 engine. Um, and this uh, didn't put power up too much, so it went from sort of 290 horsepower to uh, 300 um, and sort of similarly uh, increase in torque there. Um, but for the XKR, it went from 370 horsepower up to 400 and there were um, sort of special editions to celebrate this milestone, the first sort of production car at 400 horsepower or mass produced car by Jaguar. Um, so fantastic sort of achievement really back then, that's a pretty powerful engine. Um, and it addressed, like I said, a lot of the weak points from um, the earlier four litre cars, like timing chain tensioners and um, the uh, water pump uh, stuff. Um, so people kind of regard these 4.2 engines as bulletproof, but I'll take that with, with a pinch of salt. I mean, with any car, you want to see um, full service history, really, for one of these. I mean, just the proof that it's been well looked after is really important especially if you're expecting the car to do higher mileage. Um, so just because it's a 4.2 doesn't mean it's um, gonna last forever. You need to take care of it, regular servicing and maintenance and um, not skipping on stuff is, is really, really important there. Um, this car, my car is a 2004 um, reg registered car, but it's kind of more representative of a late 2003, it has the 4.2 engine. Um, I've had no complaints with it, um, <clears throat> but you know, performance isn't, um, that different to a four litre. So I wouldn't go for a 4.2 just because of the um, perceived uh, engine reliability. I mean, that kind of used to be true, but these cars have been around for a while now. So most of the four litre problems would have been ironed out by um, owners of those cars. So uh, go for the car, which you think is in the better condition, um, potentially lower mileage, 
and uh, you know maybe don't worry too much about the engine um, whether it's a 4 litre or a 4.2 because a 4 litre can be made to be just as reliable it just um, needs those boxes ticked I guess. So, so moving back from the engine then um, we find ourselves at the gearbox and the XK was originally offered with a 5 speed ZF gearbox and the, the gearbox um, is pretty clever it, it's, it talks to the engine and um, it learns your driving style and adapts the gear changes to suit. Um, it also has a sport button to sort of uh, make use of so I think by default you when you take off from a standstill it's in second gear but in sport mode you get first gear and also in sport mode you won't get into um, higher gears I don't think um, unless you go into cruise control or take it out of sport mode or something or if you go over 115 miles an hour potentially um, but the, the gearbox is very good um, but it's one of those sealed for life um, in inverted commas gearboxes but you really would need to get the gearbox oil changed at high mileage I'm saying you know approaching sort of 80 90 thousand miles maybe even sooner um, and specialists will be able to do this even though they're supposed to be sealed for life and this really does prolong the life of the gearbox um, the other thing to watch for them is uh, something which happened to me on, on my car even though it's a later car is that the electrical connector uh, for the gearbox does have a, a seal that goes and leaks the uh, gearbox fluid out of there so um, just one to be aware of you'll, you'll see a, you know, a drip under the car if, uh, if that's the, the case <clears throat> normally if you get in the car service they'll pick up on it and um, I think it cost me around about three or four hundred pounds to have that sorted um, in the XKR initially you ended up with a Mercedes gearbox the same sort of thing goes for that one um, it's a sealed for life one I think uh, so you need to just make sure that high mileage you get the gearbox oil uh, so uh, replaced and a bit of a, a refurb going on there just because it you don't want to end up having to get a new gearbox because they're quite costly and um, looking after the one you've got is probably the better way to go uh, so to coincide with the uh, change to the 4.2 engine the uh, gearbox was changed to a six-speed ZF and that was the same for both the XK8 and the XKR so Mercedes gearbox stopped uh, then and both cars got the six-speed ZF I'm pretty happy with this one I've had a couple of niggly problems so uh, one was that um, uh, electrical connector seal had gone but also uh, the linear switch that lives underneath the gear stick on mine had got dirty over the years and you need to kind of take quite a bit of the center console apart to get to it give it a good clean up put it back and then it seemed to be fine again but this has kind of manifests itself as um, flashing uh, lights on the uh, gear selector itself so no engine um, light you know check engine light or anything like that on the dash it was simply the p the r the n and the d uh, would flash red when you try to select them and you lost sport mode and manual selection of gears so that's kind of the warning signs for a, a dodgy linear switch there so just one to be aware of it cost me nothing to fix um but i think replacement linear switches are about a hundred pounds um if you get like a refurbished or a used item I don't know how much they are brand new probably quite expensive i think you're talking maybe two or three times that um but you know a reconditioned part is going to be pretty much as good um so yeah that's uh kind of the gearbox and sort of the last thing to talk about i guess is the exhaust system now there's loads of stuff out there to, uh, which explains about the exhaust system and how it's got a lot of restriction in it so you've got your uh, manifolds which are right next to the engine and um they're quite uh, narrow tubes so you can get performance manifolds I haven't got those but you can get them and then you go into uh, a cat on each side uh, and then that feeds into I think the uh, main sort of central silencer that lives under here somewhere and then it goes into um, an extra two kind of uh, back boxes or silencers on each side of the car back from there and there's a section of the exhaust pipe that hops over the rear axle that's very, very squashed. So there's quite a lot of restriction in the exhaust. And what that translates to for the standard car is a very, very quiet exhaust and a very refined um, sort of cabin ambience. And it's actually very, very sort of classy, I guess. Now, me um, wanting to hear that V8, I um, have actually changed my exhaust system to um, more of a straight through type uh, system so still retaining the original manifolds the cats and the large central silencer 
in the middle of the car but the system i've got replaces the um, pipe work from the central silencer back effectively with a straight through exhaust um, it's all personal preference and it's kind of too loud for some but personally i really like it maybe that means i'm a, a chav or something but um, i think it gives that uh, sort of nice v8 soundtrack to this uh, lovely uh, grand touring car and i and i really love um, hearing it so uh, yeah, I mean, I can recommend it. And what I'll do is I've actually made a video on the exhaust system that I've got. So now I'll, I'll flash up um, the sort of before and after um, comparison that I did uh, with each of the exhaust systems. So standard versus this one. So I think you'll agree that there's quite a, a sort of marked difference between standard and the Adamesh um, Stage 2 system. Like I say, it's not for everybody. That's It's kind of personal preference. I prefer it with the uh, the louder exhaust. I think it gives it a bit more um, character. Um, but if you want refinement and class, then the standard exhaust is uh, perfectly adequate. Um, so there isn't really too much to say about um, the exhaust apart from how loud you can uh, you can make it. Um, I'll put up a couple of shots of the car sort of driving past with both types of exhaust as well, just to um, give you a bit of a, a feeling for what it sounds like uh, a bit further away from the car. Um, and also some sort of in-car um, microphone shots as well driving along because I think that kind of helps uh, people decide whether they think it's for them or not. so far it seems like the uh, cabin's quite well insulated for the noise outside so it's really sort of here you do have to have the window down so this is like full throttle now and it is quite loud we're up to 70 car ahead to go and then ready steady pin it Okay, so like I say, it's personal preference really, but uh, yeah, I love making noise in this thing. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's it for this this uh, this video. I kind of touched on um, the various uh, parts of the drivetrain. I didn't really talk about the diff. Uh, there isn't really too much to say about that. Um, it's uh, an open diff, so you know you'll get one tire fire if you try and uh, pull away too quickly. But you can get limited slip um, options as well. But I mean it's it'll be you'll be able to do like better like skids and stuff in it but it, this isn't really a sports car it's not really designed for that kind of um that kind of handling performance and actually um it's a lot more suited to grand touring and cruising along i mean xkr owners may want to go for a limited slip diff certainly in the prototype xkrr which had a, a manual gearbox and a limited slip differential is supposed to be you know, markedly improved um, handling wise. But for this car, I, don't, I really don't think it needs this limited slip diff. One thing of note though, is that the differential in these cars um, can be destroyed pretty quickly if you try and do like burnouts and that kind of stuff. So it's best not to um, sort of indulge in yobbish behavior in these. It's uh, not that kind of car. So um, I'm not sure many of you won't be up to that kind of stuff anyway, but uh, yeah, just a word of caution there um so that's pretty much it uh i hope you enjoyed this video um there's not really too much i can really do in this lockdown situation i'd love to be able to go out and drive this thing and really let you hear the engine um in its sort of full glory but until the next time um you know i'm hoping to bring out some more xk videos now that i'm at home and hopefully if lockdown um 
gets a bit more relaxed, I'll be able to get over to my parents again and do a bit more of a, 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 walk, a better walk around of the uh, the Lotus uh, Esprit that I've bought. So um, until the next time, take care of yourselves, stay safe and see you later.